Welcome to the course on principles of vibration control. Today we are going to focus on vibration isolation. So vibration isolation we will look into it from different uh, elements point of view. So first of all we will talk about we will give an introduction on vibration isolation. Then we will talk about how different springs can be used for vibration isolation. And then we will talk about dampers for the same purpose and some of the subdivisions of the dampers which are solid dampers and high damping material. So, essentially we are going to see how different damping elements are useful for isolating the vibration. Now, when we talk about vibration isolations, they are required for uh, two broadly two different types of cases. One case is that you have a noisy machine, let us say you have a uh, washing machine which is generating too much of a sound. So, you have a noisy machine and the, you want to absorb the vibration sounds etcetera of the machine. So, that is one type. The other type is that you want to isolate a sensitive equipment from the noisy environment. So, in one case you have a source of vibration and noise and you want to isolate that and in the other case there is noise and vibration in the ambience and you want to isolate a precision system from the effect of this noise. So, these are the two different cases uh, that in which vibration isolations are required and these are generally given in the form of springs and dampers. So, let us see what are the different possibilities that are there for us. Well, for isolating elements, we have pneumatics, we have hydraulics, electromagnetic, electrodynamic and elastro damping type of materials. And particularly in the uh, elastro dynamic uh, damping category, we have springs, we have dampers and complex dynamics and uh, damping and stiffness matrix that we generally use in the elastro damping materials category. There are other categories which after a point of time when we will talk about active control, I will touch a few of them. Now, first we will uh, you know focus on the springs and then we will go to the dampers in this category. So, let, let us first of all talk about the springs. Springs can be of many different types. The most common spring is the helical spring which you will see in day to day uh, you know applications. These are used for example, in earthquake or vibration prone areas even below the superstructure and they generally have a very high load bearing capacity and a quite an effective low frequency vibration isolation. Since earthquake happens uh, you know it affects in the low frequency regime. So, this kind of helical springs are quite good for that and if you look at the spring constant k it depends on the shear modulus of the material, it depends on the wear diameter very very significantly d to the power 4 and it also inversely varies with the coil diameter the mean coil diameter that is d here as has been shown here and also the number of coils that means once you know that what is the free length once you know the total number of coils then you uh, you will be knowing about the details of it so using these informations you should be able to find out that what is the spring stiffness k. So, this is the helical spring and uh, uh, this kind of springs uh, in compression uh, actually may vary significantly their stiffness properties uh, if the ends are not properly secured. Now, let us look into some of the applications of the helical springs as you can see here that this is a huge superstructure and just below that the inside this enclosures the springs are there. In some cases there will be springs like you can see these springs in this case here. In some cases the springs could be also with the dampers and here uh, in the between the two image if you look at it in this case it is squeezed more due to the effect of an earthquake. So, uh, you know 
it shows that it is very effective. In some cases, actually there are quite an exotic additional springs like this U type springs as you can see here that is also added in some cases to further enhance this isolation capability. Now, in all these cases helical spring is used for the development of seismic isolator. So, that earthquake resistance is possible in the system. Let us look into some of the other springs like transversely loaded springs. Most of the times we think that a spring is actually loaded uh, like from the top. So, generally we consider a spring which is loaded from the top, but in this case uh, as the figure is showing that we are not loading it in this axial manner, but transversely. So, this transverse loading arrangement it is found that it offers actually higher load carrying capacity provided you actually need to have a proper uh, this thing. So, that there is no wave buckling etcetera that takes place in the system. So, you need to have proper guides uh, in the spring deflection and this in this case also you will get an increased damping because there will be friction between the spring surface and the support. So, that will enhance uh, the damping. See, there will be more frictions here on in all these regions. So, the damping will be enhanced. So, in this case the spring constant depends on the helix angle, the elastic modulus E, where diameter again is playing a crucial role you can see all of them here and then the coil diameter is coming here in the denominator inversely proportional and the number of coils also is coming into the picture. One thing you can see the difference between the last one is that instead of the shear modulus here the spring stiffness depends on the elastic modulus E and in most of the materials E is uh, much higher than G and as a result you get a larger bearing capacity and also good damping in the transversely loaded spring elements. Now, there is another variety of spring element that is particularly used for small linkages and joints and this is known as a slotted spring element. This also extracts the advantage of uh, getting stiffness from the modulus Young's modulus of elasticity rather than shear modulus of elasticity. To do that the spring is actually slotted. So, this is a typically slotted spring where these uh, you know actually from the blanks it is directly uh, made and the sizes are given here. So, with respect to the size ratio you get a coefficient a n and then you have this coefficient you have the coil diameter all other things then you can get the spring constant and you can see here that it is directly proportional to the modulus of elasticity and it has a high accuracy in a small uh, outline of a size uh, you can get it. So, that is how it is very popular particularly for the link developments etcetera. One application you can see here that this is the typical slotted spring system and it is used in this type of you know link connections in uh, hinges etcetera. So, this is uh, the second type of spring. The third type of spring is that where we actually play with the coil diameter. So, in earlier two cases coil diameter was constant, but here the coil diameter is variable and it can be variable like in this manner or it can be variable like a crochet shaped or it can be variable uh, and the pitch also uh, can vary in this case pitch is not varying, but here the pitch itself is varying as you can see the pitch here and pitch here is not same. So, you can bring nonlinearity in many ways you can by varying the coil diameter also by varying the variable pitch. Now, such systems are usually done in such a manner that uh, they actually uh, with respect to different frequency level of excitation they uh, work well. Uh, and uh, however, sometimes they are actually uh, susceptible to sub or super harmonic vibrations and uh, isolators with a high damping uh, are generally used to alleviate 
this type of a problem. So, this is a statically nonlinear coil spring system. The other very useful spring system is known as Belleville spring system. Now, you can see that there are actually 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 Belleville springs like washer type of an arrangement they are there. And in the Belleville spring, there are many parameters we can control. One is of course, the base diameter and then this angle and uh, which is generally between 2 degree to 6 degree and then this d by d ratio the which is 2 to 3 and then of course, the height. So, you can play with so many parameters. In fact, one can find out the load deflection relationship for each system and if you look at it here also, you are getting the modulus of elasticity for stiffness, but here additionally what you are getting is a complex expression with respect to uh, the deflection of the load deformation relationship and that if I try to actually see it in certain regimes. For example, when the height to thickness ratio is 0.4, you would see that this almost behaves like a linear system. But the you change the height to thickness ratio to 2.4, you will see that this is behaving in a completely nonlinear manner and behaving more like a hardening spring. Again, if you vary the h by t ratio below a certain level, you may also get it you know some of the other type of deformations here. So, thus by varying this h by t ratio, you can get different types of uh, load deformation relationship in such a system. Now, keeping this point in mind, uh, it is actually used in nitinol washer and springs uh, as you can see here that nitinol helical spring and this is a believable nitinol uh, washers. In this cases, uh, it is done intentionally because uh, what you can do is that uh, the h by t ratio being important in terms of uh, showing the linear relationship or the hardened relationship and you can vary this h by t ratio by passing a small current in each one of them. So, if you pass a current then there will be a phase change in the nitinol because it is of shape memory material and then because of this phase change you would observe that the h will be changing, the height will be changing and as the height will be changing the geometric parameters will change and the same system will behave like a hardening spring etcetera. So, you can actually effectively use it for various types of seismic isolation systems. So, that is uh, uh, available spring. Now, another type of a material which is also used uh, more like even though it is uh, it is used as an isolator, but its stiffness uh, and damping both are equally important in this type of cases because there are inter layer damping that takes place in it and these are known as wear mesh material. In such a system uh, actually there are two stiffnesses the dynamic stiffness and the static stiffness. So, the static stiffness is you can simply obtain through a quasi static load deformation relationship, but then if you also know the material parameter and a ratio of vibration amplitude to the height, you can find out the dynamic stiffness and uh, this is a highly nonlinear material, but it is very very effective for vibration isolation in machine foundations, particularly for applications like uh, you know hospital floors or for applications uh, like uh, submarine uh, machines are to be isolated, noisy machines, wire mesh material are of very good uh, use for such cases. S uh, a very similar material like wire mesh is actually the felt material, but in this case uh, it is made generally of nylon or rubber fiber and in this case the dynamic stiffness is given by this relationship where you have again three material parameters. N, M and A1. Now, how does the wire mesh material look like? This is a typical wire mesh type of a thing and you can see that this is used uh, as an isolator element for machine foundation. So, that means, if there is some vibration here, it will not be transmitted to the base. So, base will remain vibration free that is the idea of using the wire mesh damper for machine foundation. 
Now, we have seen so many varieties, right? We have seen these uh, kind of felt pads or coil maces, then we have seen metallic variations. There are also some variations like air springs and rubbers, I have not discussed them, but these do exist as a good uh, you know type of a spring for vibration isolation. And uh, each one of them has a typical area in which they work and this is generally defined with respect to the level of displacement. If the displacement amplitude is quite small, then it is cork or felt pad. If it is more than rubber, even more metal, if it is the maximum, then the air springs are used, something like 250 millimeter kind of a displacement. So, depending on the level of amplitude of displacement, uh, the isolators are actually chosen. Now, we will consider the vibration isolation of a single degree of freedom system and uh, this is subjected to an isolator which is a generalized spring element. That means, it is not a pure spring, but it is a spring plus damper. Such kind of a system has a stiffness which is complex stiffness. So, that means, it will the you know uh, absorb or bear the load by getting displaced, but as well as uh, it will work partially like a damper. Now, there are two ways uh, in which a spring can also show this kind of a damping behavior. If the spring is made of rubbery material, then it will have a complex elastic modulus and hence that complex elastic modulus, the imaginary part of it actually shows the damping. Because if you remember that uh, we plotted basically with respect to temperature, the two modulus of elasticity E prime and E double prime. Okay. So, E prime is the glass modulus and we have seen that from the glassy region it goes down like this. So, this is the glassy region E double prime which is actually the loss modulus that varies on the other hand in this manner. So, the point where this transition is happening this roughly it is the same point where you will see that the maximum peak is of the E double prime. So, this is the E double prime and this is the E prime. So, the loss modulus also maximizes along that temperature which is known as the glass transition temperature. So, this actually contributes to the loss part of the damping. Now, springs like transversely loaded spring could dissipate energy due to the friction between the spring and outer surface and the supporting frame, whereas in this case it is not friction induced loss, but in this case the loss ha is happening because of the rearrangement or the motion of the chains, you know atomic chains which are there inside a polymeric material. Now, uh, let us consider a simple problem where we have a mass here and we have a spring, but this spring is having a stiffness which is k star. The star denotes that this is a complex spring, that means a spring with complex stiffness. So, that is why we are using the star symbol to it. Now, suppose this is subjected to a you know kind of a harmonic excitation. Okay. So, at the base you have x 1 t and here it is x t. Now, what is our k star? k star has a real part let us say it is k and k star has an imaginary part and we are writing it with an imaginary j along with omega c and in that case I can actually take the k out and it gets into this particular form 1 plus j omega c by k and this can be further written as 1 plus j uh, you know this 2 c by 2 root k m and root over m omega by k which means it will become k times 1 plus j 2 omega zeta where omega is the non-dimensional frequency parameter. So, it is non-dimensional uh, frequency parameter. and this is the damping ratio zeta. So, with respect to this the k star 
can be written as k which is the real part of it. So, this is k plus j 2 omega zeta k. This is the you know imaginary part of the stiffness which contributes to the loss of the system. Now, let us say this is a generic definition because here we have considered both the stiffness of the spring as well as the loss uh, due to the viscoelastic part of it. Now, if I try to form the equation of motion, so again we will look into the equation of motion here. In this case, you do not have any other excitation, this is a base excitation problem. So, you have mass m here and it is moving upwards, so which means it has an inertia force m x double dot and also it is getting a spring force which is resisting the motion. So, that is a real force that is k star uh, the difference between x and x 1. So, if I add them together we get this relationship where it is giving us as uh, m x double dot uh, plus k star x uh, minus x 1. So, it is m x double dot plus k star x minus x 1 and then if I uh, you know apply x equals to uh, or x 1 equals to uh, x 1 e raise to the power j omega t and we apply here also as x e raise to the power j omega t, then this equation would become further simplified in the frequency domain and then it would become k star minus m omega square x 1 capital X 1 where capital X 1 is the amplitude here at the base and that equals to k star x where x is the amplitude of the mass m, the displacement amplitude of the mass m. So, from this equation we can actually write what is x 1 over x and x 1 over x is k star over k star minus m omega square. So, then I can write down the transmissibility which is the amplitude of the 2 ratio. So, it is k star over k star minus m omega square and what is k star? We already said that k star is k into 1 plus j 2 omega zeta. So, we can write it here and we can cancel the k from numerator and denominator. So, it is a ratio of 1 plus j 2 zeta omega over 1 minus omega square okay, k we are cancelling. So, this part how it is coming you need to just keep in your mind that denominator we have k minus m omega square, you are taking the k out. So, you are getting it as k minus m omega square by k and that is k times 1 minus omega square by k by m and that can be written as k times 1 minus omega square okay, because this is the natural frequency omega n. So, that is how this 1 minus omega square term comes and of course, the imaginary part is j 2 omega zeta both in the top in the bottom. Now, I can find out that what is the amplitude in the top case it is simply 1 plus 2 zeta omega square and in the bottom it is 1 minus omega square square plus 2 zeta omega square. So, thus we can get the transmissibility of the vibration that means what is the ratio of the uh, you know displacement that I am giving here and the response that I am finding for the mass m. So, I can find that out. Now, this transmissibility can be obtained for different types of cases. For example, if I consider type 1 solid damper, type 1 solid dampers are like low damping natural rubbers. Now, here the k star is simply k plus k into 1 plus j eta where eta is the loss factor. So, uh, this is not a function of the frequency, the complex stiffness and it is simply the, it has a real part and it has an imaginary part. So, you can find out the transmissibility now by applying this expression of k star that it is k into 1 plus j eta in the numerator and denominator k into 1 plus j eta minus m omega square and then you divide both numerator and denominator by k you are going to get 1 plus j eta, here you are going to get 1 minus omega square just like last time and then j eta. 
separately and that would mean that if I have to take the amplitude, it will be amplitude of each one of the individual part which is square root of 1 plus eta square divided by 1 minus omega square square plus eta square. So, that is the transmissibility corresponding to low damping natural rubbers or solid dampers. Now, let us look at another case if it is high damping material. In that case, the k uh, real is not constant, it is a function of frequency and k omega is k 1 times omega where omega is known to us already. So, here it slightly changes and in the final relationship it becomes very neat, it is 1 over square root of 1 plus eta square divided by 1 minus omega square square plus eta square. So, high damping material you can see that in this particular case uh, it is the omega and the eta which is directly controlling the transmissibility of the system. Now, if we try to actually plot this, so we have viscous damping plot, we have type 1 damper, we have type 2 damper. So, if we plot this for a frequency ratio value, let us say from 0 0.1 uh, to 10, if we plot this 0 0.1 to 10 and then you will see that for all the cases when omega equals to 0, it always starts invariably from unity. You can even check it. If you check it in the last uh, in a system, if you check it, you just uh, you know you, you can just put the omega ratio omega to be 0 and in that case you would see that this omega will be 0. So, this will be square root of 1 plus eta square over 1 plus eta square meaning thereby that the transmissibility will be unity. So, all transmissibilities actually start from unity. So, and the same thing happens for the type 1 damper also. From there at omega equals to 1 when uh, excitation frequency equals the first fundamental natural frequency you are going to invariably see the peak. After that the change is important because this is what is showing the decay ratio, how it is decaying. Now, here we can see that a type 1 damper is actually decaying much faster than a type 2 damper. So, some configurations are good for high frequency damping, particularly in this case type 1 is better than the type 2 damper uh, for isolator design. So, this is where we will put an end and in the next lecture we will learn about active vibration control. Thank you.